Nobody seeing this image in the Sistine Chapel could imagine that mere self-depiction was the artist's object. Michelangelo is there at the Last Judgment, suspended between heaven and hell, appealing to God for redemption. One might add that the difference between scent and skin is also the opposition between Michelangelo, the idealized artist, and Michelangelo, the broken-nosed mortal, a war horse who wore the same dog skin leggings for months on end until his skin came away when he peeled them off, an old man who had no use to his body other than to keep on working for the greater glory of a god. Nor would one imagine that anybody could construe this as simply a signature, and yet that is the received tradition of art history. Self-portraiture starts in the margins as a way of a singularly authorship. Painters should be seen as painters, not just an anonymous craftsman, and develops as a way of promoting one's art in person. It becomes more prevalent with better mirrors, better paints, a bigger clientele, more competition, and thus a greater need to promote oneself. Before self-portraits eventually break free of the crowd, becoming the image of I, myself, and me alone, artists are generally there as witness. The self-portraiture in a senza, which is a, really a cover for signing the painting with one's image. Histories of a self-portraiture tell this originating myth over and again, beginning with a Masasio in the Branacci Chapel in 1425, his eyes on crest, a giveaway, and ending a century or so later with Raphael chatting to P Ptolemy and uh, Zoroaster, another giveaway, in the school of Athens, as if uh, these artists had no larger concerns than self-promotion. In between, of course, there is the troublesome precedent of uh, aberrate Dior, but he is just uh, freakishly early. Whether Dior was the first artist to paint an uh, autonomous self-portrait can hardly be said for sure, since so few works of art from this period survive. The tenacious idea that the people never painted themselves alone before the Renaissance, or with any degree of self-consciousness, is in any case rather, than, rather like the idea that the people had no selves to paint, that the sense of a self was a something that had yet to be invented. This idea was promoted early on by the founding father of art history, Jacob Burkhardt. But Burkhardt's vision of the Renaissance as the moment when the fully rounded modern self finally steps free of a medieval mass uniformity is challenged, even by paintings themselves. Lost masterpieces such as the legendary self-portrait of our place, famed as the greatest artist of ancient Greece, or one X grave self-portrait in which he seems to be contemplating both himself and death. Conversely, the artist's face among the crowd never really disappears. All self-portrait traditions come round again in perpetuity. Franz Hals is there among the Amsterdam bowers in the 17th century. Wallace's Chris appears in the victory of a Breda. Edward Manette listens pensively among the milling figures in music in the Tuileries. The British sculptor 
Mark Quinn's rubber cast of his own skin, still bearing his、uh, features, hangs upside down from a hook, flapping open like a skinned banana, but completely empty, as if a hodoni had flown. Its title is no visible means of escape. Quinn is always trying to free the spirit in his self-portraits, like a. Michelangelo half a millennium earlier. Even where conventions develop, the artist as a witness, as a religious adherent, as a professional painter, self-portraits often have far more complex origins and motives. They are made as love letters, appeals for clemency, campaigns against specific people. Or the art world in general, they are made in revolt against one's patron, or to exorcise one's demons, like Franz Xavier, Messer Smith, with his、uh, stricken, gasping, grimacing bronze hands, made to see of the spirit of a、uh, symmetry. Sometimes they are made out of a madness or fury. When the monks of Mount Olivetto held Sodoma to paint a fresco of the first miracle of Benedict, their patron saint, he arrived with a menagerie of horses, dogs, genie pigs, badgers. Swans and a raven he had taught to shout amusing insults when people knock at the door. Sodoma insisted that they all be stabled, and then demanded a numerous items of clothing for himself and his assistants. Florentine stockings, new shoes, even the ostentatious yellow cloak of a Milanese. Nobleman, who had come to take orders, the monks kept a written account of the visit, in which they refer to the artist as El Matasio, the buffoon. He did not live for three years. Sodoma was、uh, supposed to be painting the body. Benedict successfully praying. That his、uh, nurse's broken tray will be mended by divine intervention, and sure enough, you see the tray and Benedict praying on the left, and then receiving congratulations on the right. But the being in the center, far larger than anyone else, dressed in the Milanese cloak and the Florentine horse. Florentine hose is the artist. Around him flock the badgers, swans, and raven, as if he were Saint Francis of Assisi. Way in the distance hangs the mended tray, to which Sodoma gestures. Here, take a look at this, as if he had performed the miracle himself. It is impossible to view the paintings without being completely distracted by Sodoma. He is not there because he believes, like a Botticelli. He is not there as a witness so much as the main protagonist. This is simply a insane folly that the monks never managed to prevent. If they ever tried, worn down by his. Obstreperous presence. One assumes piety in Renaissance artists because the alternative seems too heretical for the times. Just as one assumes that any artist of any era appearing in a Babel scene must be on the side of a right, but Caravaggio, in his early self-portraits, is among the Dramatis personae of some very violent biblical incidents, in which he is no 
simple onlooker, nor even on the side of a virtue, never entirely innocent. He's always, in some measure, complicit. Caravaggio is there, for instance, in the taking of a crest, in which Jesus is being arrested with appalling force in the Garden of、uh, Gethsemane the night before Good Friday. The sense of emotion of a figure's gesturing and、uh, twisting in the darkness is vividly proleptic, as if they might burst right out of the canvas. Christ is the only still figure, hence calmly clasped in a brutal onslaught, withstanding the terrible right to left motion as a Judah, and a rush of soldiers in jet black still close in, as if for the kill. Violent, crowded, and tight, the event is caught in the flash bulb glare. And at the far right is a Caravaggio himself, holding up a lantern to illuminate both scene and picture. Caravaggio has made it visible, brought this vision of a crushed、uh, courage and suffering into the light. But the lamp is not some trite symbol, any more than the self-portrait is a signature. The taking of Christ is not just a revelation; it has the character of a revelation. The darkness suddenly vanquishes the bright light. Caravaggio shows us the scene and his face in profile, craning to see over the heads of the soldiers, bearing the same expression of open mouthed awe we all might wear before this violent kidnap. He is on the very outskirts of the picture, struggling to see. And make the gospel story visible. This artist、uh, evangelist, but his light also aids the soldiers. He appears to a companion. Is he not, in some sense, their accomplice? Some people have seen mutiny in this self-portrait, a sort of a "take me as I am" retort to a person who may have been trying to control the contents of the image. Certainly, almost half of Caravaggio's paintings were regarded as too independent for the church. But even if it started this way, which seems a limited motivation, my Vision as I have conceived and shown it, this self-portrait is profoundly uninterested in drawing attention to Caravaggio. It is a work of a spiritual empathy. Caravaggio enters into the scene in every way. Why do artists paint self-portraits? It's not a question prompted by portraits. One does not stand before images of monarchs, philosophers, aristocrats, or popes, trying to guess why they were immortalized in paint. The roughed courtier, the periwigged anatomist, the uniformed soldier, their place in history, complete with、uh, details of occupation and status. And a discreet essay on personality is pictorially assured, even if the entire lives of anonymous sitters are lost. One thing is known about them: that somebody wanted their portrait, somebody paid an artist, or perhaps the artist himself wanted to record their image. But even this last possibility. Does not necessarily hold true in the case of a self-portraiture, for many artists have dragged forth a likeness only under duress. At least one was painfully extracted in the mistaken assumption that it was required, and many more have been created, then rejected, in a state of heightened disgust. Some are made. With nobody in mind, others for anyone or everyone. 
a select group was commissioned and continues to be commissioned for a very particular audience, namely visitors to the Uffizi self-portrait collection in Florence. This began as a private gallery of a Cardinal Leopoldo Medici, who had become obsessed with images that embodied both artist and style. He started with a Guccino in 1664 and amassed a hundred more, past and present, before his death. Now there are over a thousand, including works by Titian, Rembrandt, and uh, questionably Velasquez, and the Uffizi has had to ban unsolicited donations from those ambitious to join the club. Anyone managing to get an uh, appointment to visit the Vasari Corridor, where a portion of the collection is displayed, will see the Leonardo Leopoldo did not always get much return on his interest in style. An early etching of the collection, hung three deep floor to ceiling, shows what is still apparent today, that it contains some of the dullest self-portraits ever made, head and shoulders facing the same direction. Many are not much more than variations on a passport photograph, formal to a fault, but rigorously avoiding anything personal. They end up in opposition to everything that makes self-portraiture interesting. No sense of a self, no oh, negotiation between the self and the world, no implied milieu, no distinctive stance, gesture, expression, intellectual or conceptual ideas, just a conformity to type. Of course, there are tremendous exceptions, many discussed here, and the sense of a collegial reality is strong and affecting, but the official honor appears to have crushed the independent spirit. Self-portraits do have other coarse and uncomplicated uh, functions. Sir David Wilkie, in a rush to complete his enormous Taven scene, The Blind Fiddler, inserted his own face in a wig and the mob cap of a tipsy woman as if it were no more than a handy set of uh, asexual features. Francis Bacon said he painted himself only because everyone else was dying off like flies. Although the idea that artists make images of themselves for the de Milux, being so compelled to paint a face that even their own will do, strikes a false note when one considers that the struggle to describe his oneself is hardly a casual experience. Even Picasso, superfluent draughtsman, complained that he could never catch the look of himself on paper and would have to cut a hole in a canvas and put a mirror behind it in any case just to glimpse what he really looked like. When an uh, artist wants to join the great art club of uh, traditions, the ambitions can be outrageously flagrant. Sir Anthony Van Dyck repressed Raphael's double portrait with a friend. Rembrandt painted himself in the distinctive poses of uh, Peter, Paul, Rubens, and uh, Tisha. Otto Dix went right back to the purity of Hans Holbein, drooming home his claim to German cultural inheritance. James Whistler tried to paint himself in the pose of a Valadzquez, Pablo de Valladolid, and spent the last three years of his life intermittently trying to raise some trace of a the spinner spirit in this ghostly 
failure of a, a seance. Even the smallest anthology of artists showing off royal gold chains would include Tixiang, never seen without Emperor Charles V's special, special gift. Rembrandt, who probably had to buy his own, and above all, Van Dyck's self-portrait with a sunflower, made when he was court painter to Charles I of England. This startling image is nothing less than a uh, awards ceremony. Van Dyck, in scarlet satin, turns his head our way while lifting his uh, important chain with one hand and pointing at the upside flower with the other. The triangulation of hands, eyes, and the flower joins the dots. I got this royal gold for that painted gold. Though the symbolism of sunflower was enigmatic, uh, enigmatic even in the 17th century, did it imply art or nature? or the sunshine of the king's favor, this dark oval crowned with golden petals turning its face upon the artists. The picture is a glowing self-appraisal, but like so many of Van Dyck's portraits, this smooths away the flaws and bestow ineffable glamour on that English court. The artist cannot seem to stop himself from undermining the perfection with uh, contradictory details. What tells against all this glory is the tangible of uh, damp hair clinging to Van Dyck's slightly clammy brow. The artist would be dead at 42, it was said of overwork. Self-portrait with a sunflower is a public performance, a star turn. It implies and requires an audience. The triangulation within it projects directly afterwards, too. When Dex looks at us, we look at the Sun King, who in turn gazes upon his uh, favored painter. It is a picture that calls for applause. But it is not congenial. It is not, so to speak, on our side. Even the most uh, upturned of self-portraits, those that invite a two-way encounter, uh, where the artist is explicitly appearing by popular demand, are not necessarily sociable. Some artists want to appear in public and tell you so in their self-portraits. Others have been forced to do it and show it in defensive recoil. Compare two paintings made a few years apart, we know precisely why Nicolas Poisson portrayed himself for his motives are laid out in a irritable letter about the origins of a Judas Louster's self-portrait. We know nothing except what the painting reveals. In fact, so little is known about Lester that for centuries her paintings were attributed to Franz Haus, whose fame obscured her reputation quite literally in the case of a, a picture that was found to have her monogram. GL entwined with a star, pawning on her surname, which means a uh, loud star, hidden beneath his uh, thought signature. Lester's existence might eventually have been forgotten, but for this buoyant picture. Intimacy is its trick. She was just working in her studio when you walked in, whereupon she pulled a, a seat for you too, cropped like an informal photo, just below the waist, oh, and so tight that one elbow and part of the collar do not make it into the frame. She, lean, she leans casually back with a conversational smile, off duty with a social 
with a sociable moment. Lester smiles. The work in progress implies because she is the kind of an artist who paints merely for fiddlers, and perhaps because she is fond of a joke, she is not trying to downplay her art, in which she takes evident pride so much as play up its levity, the neat positioning of her two heads, inclined. In different directions, but both looking at you, embraces you in the mutual warmth of the circle, like what Disney sat beside with his、uh, animated Milky. Lester gestures lightly at the fiddler with the tip of her brush, inviting you too to smile at the artist, of the little fellow, sawing away with his、uh, bow. You could not have a warmer welcome. Pausing by contrast, distances himself from the task. He sits back from the picture alone. Of、uh, uh, sits back from the picture playing, enclosed by his own paintings. The three blind.、Uh, the three behind him, the、um, one before him. In an attitude of a fastidious withdrawal, he has only greeted to paint a likeness of himself, because nobody else in Rome is up to the task, and only to satisfy a friend. Quote: I should not have undertaken anything like this for any other living man. End quote. He informed his old friend Paul Chatelot. Who hardly needed to be told, since he had years of difficulty persuading him to paint the picture in the first place. Pussin is、uh, sequestered in gloom, black hair, black clothes, draped over his shoulder like a funeral wreath, swathing a coffin, black diamond glittering in his ring. His shadow falls ominous, ominously across the Latin inscription on the canvas behind him, a effigy of Nicholas Posen from Les Andelys at the age of fifty-six in the year of、uh, Roman Jubilee in sixteen fifty. It reads like a, a epitaph, proclaiming his、uh, affiliation with the classical Rome. In an austere third person, as if someone else was speaking, the painting is resonant with a solemn music. Yet it is not the mood, or even the strange composition of the picture, with its quadratic forms and its mysterious air of deliberation and finality, that strikes some commentators so much as the trail for. Visual clues waiting to be deciphered. His toga, a masonic robe, the four-sided pyramid of his、uh, diamond, an、uh, emblem of a Freemasonry, or a symbol of a Stoicism. The eye on the diadem worn by the woman in the canvas behind him, the eye of all-seeing vigilance. That represents the supreme being to Freemasons. Why the picture was practically painted for Dan Brown to decode? That this woman represents friendship or artist, as prescribed in iconographic dictionaries of the period, seems a good deal more feasible and makes sense. Given that the picture was a gift for a friend, but the character of the picture would hardly be altered, even if she turned out to be all-seeing vigilance. It is her positioning in the composition, as much deliberate as every other element, that matters. She looks the other way from Poussin. Her animation. 
balanced by his、uh, absolute composure, just as his hand rests motionless upon the book, while the golden frames of the painting shook back and forth like trains rushing in different directions behind the stationed gravity of his head. For posing these paintings, whatever they show, are his life. By the time he finished this self-portrait in his、uh, mid-fifties, he had a reputation across Europe as one of the most intellectual and disciplined of masters. He had left France more than twenty years before, despising French painters as、uh, Strapazzoni, Glebe Hacks, who make a sport of turning out a picture in twenty-four hours. Choose. Could only be distilled from intense and protracted, protracted cogitation. Compositions had to be tested over and again in advance, rehearsed with wax forms in a toy theater. Even the most violent action in his work is marked by stasis and meditation. His paintings require you to stop and think, learn, mark, and inwardly digest their mysterious dramas, and so it is with this self-portrait, a summation of his art as well as himself, neither offering instant disclosure. These paintings spread like a hand of cards behind him, an allegory, a blank canvas. The back of a canvas are all easel pictures. Being an artist in Rome at that time still meant producing frescoes, panel paintings, and altarpieces to order. Their subject matter generally dictated by the patron, but for Poisson it meant only one thing: easel paintings on landscape-shaped canvas. Stretched, framed, and painted exactly like the ones in this picture, his landscape narratives, moreover, and his great religious paintings were never some compromise with the patron. Poussin, considered to have had a stern and a melancholy temperament, prone to irritation and a loathing constraint, avoided all the usual professional. Convention to the point of、uh, bypassing the market altogether. He worked only for patrons who had become friends. That he sits in a booth of his own paintings feels majestically apt for an artist whose sense of、uh, freedom depended on making art for himself. He would not have painted himself for any other living man, and he never. Painted any other living person, the public reputation encloses the painter, and the painter's passionate sense of a vocation dominates the picture, a passion that has its ultimate testimony in his face. Poussin appears worn out, hypertense, his eyes red rimmed with the effort of achieving such a high degree of. Probity, and yet the repression pulls in another direction too, from this fierce look of honor and discipline to something that looks surprisingly like a sorrow. It is often said that Poussin was two different artists; that the younger Poussin was a proto-romantic, whose pictures were. Charged with all sorts of、uh, conflicting and dangerous emotions, a man who could draw himself tousled and scowling in the early years in Rome, the kind of a man who could be arrested during a street brawl like a Caravaggio. This artist cools and contracts into the later Poussin, strict classicist and a methodologizer. Whose paintings are about easy pleasures, 
perhaps Poussin has moved from intensity to profundity, but something of the younger man's strength of emotion is alive in the older man's face. Deep sheeted within the picture, Poussin avoids social contact. He makes an appearance, as all self-portraits must, with a marked sense of a withdrawal. But this refusal to draw close, to be on our side, is, is elevated to the level of a pictorial principle.